Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea in the 1950s and 60s, it was noticed that people, mostly women, of the Four tribe, that's F-O-R-E, uh, were dying of what was originally thought to be a genetic disorder since it happened among family members. The disease stole away the affected person's ability to talk, walk, and eat, and to eventually die a shivering death. We now know that this was Kuru, a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy or prion disease. Same as Christfield Jakob disease, mad cow and cattle, scrappy and sheep, and chronic wasting in elk. So joining me today to talk about this fascinating story of Kuru is Chandana Bala. Chandi is the president of Global Insight Advisory Network and writes on the intersection of healthcare and technology, and she's also a fantastic writer at Gideon Informatics. Hi, Chandy, and welcome back to the program. Hi, Robert. Really happy to be back. Thank you. Oh, I'm very happy to have you once again. Uh, again, your your blog you do on Gideon is just fantastic, and I encourage Thank people you. to uh, check it out. I'll go ahead and link to it so uh, they can. But let's go ahead and get in with a little bit about Kuru, and I wanted to go over some of the foundational information. And as I mentioned in the intro, Kuru is a prion disease. Um, so can you give the audience a good overview of what a prion is? Yes. So prions are, prion stands for infectious proteins. Uh, we are all used to uh, infectious diseases called by, caused by bacteria, viruses, parasites, and prions are the first group of diseases caused by proteins, which are the building blocks of our lives. Um, one of the, 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 the discovery of prions and how their structure is and everything resulted in almost three different Nobel Prizes throughout through the years. So it's a very significant um, discovery in the history of human medicine. Um, prions, uh, sorry, I call them prions. I know Robert calls them prions. Um, either ways, they are extremely deadly and they are caused by proteins that misfold and then actually infect, infect uh, proteins around them to misfold as well, causing a chain of misfolded proteins that eventually lead to deadly diseases like Kuru, which is 100% fatal. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that I always found was that, you know, most infectious agents are, you know, have some kind of genetic material, DNA or RNA or both prions is a protein so it has none yes and i think that's what is the scariest part of it and reading about it a bit makes you feel like this it's a setup for the zombie apocalypse of some sort yeah but yeah yeah, yeah pretty scary stuff now let's go ahead and um talk and jump into kuru a little bit um especially the history which i find incredibly fascinating um can you give us a, a lesson <laughs> about the history of Kuru and the geography of Kuru, because this was, of course, never found in the United States or, or India, as far as I know. So mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about the history of Kuru? Yes. So Kuru um, was pivotal in the eventual discovery of prions and all the other diseases caused of that group of uh, the TSE group of diseases. But it's no longer a threat for us, which is good. Um, Kuru was in its heyday was in the 1950s and was mostly found in Papua New Guinea. It's a group of islands, uh, which are part of the Australia, New Zealand, Australasia group of islands. And as you mentioned earlier, there are major, they were predominantly found in a community called the Four, F O R E. So that's kind of the geography was almost just localized to that area, which is a good thing in a way. Um, that it didn't spread. And in the 1950s, almost 200 people died every year. Um, I think uh, the recorded number of cases of Kuru is about 2,700 cases till about 1957, when um, Australians, uh, patrol officers who were in Papua New Guinea started recording uh, instances of these diseases. And in the late 1950s, there was an American doctor called Daniel Gaidesek, who traveled to Papua New Guinea specifically to study these this mysterious illness that was killing uh, people in the in Papua New Guinea, 
um, this was a pivotal thing because he was the first person to connect these illnesses to the practice of endo cannibalism of, of eating your own. Um, so that that was a historic uh, discovery uh, in in the 1950s, and he won a Nobel Prize for it as he deserved to. And in the 1960s, the Australian government banned the practice of cannibalism, which then decreased the cases significantly. But at the time, there were a lot of people dying, and it actually affected the male-to-female sex ratio. I'm sure we'll get into that soon, but the male-to-female sex ratio, uh, where females were dying at much larger proportions than male, uh, so much so that it ended up being almost a threes-to-one uh, ratio. Um, so that was the discovery. So Kukuru was kind of contained. And the next big leap of discovery for prions was in the 1990s. So in the late 1990s, uh, Stanley Prusner discovered prions. Uh, prions and they, that was in the next huge milestone discovery in this, this, in this uh, history of prions. And he won a Nobel Prize for that as well. Um, and then in 2002, the, there was another pivotal discovery because uh, uh, Kurt Worthrich, I, I believe, uh, discovered how exactly the proteins folded, which, as you can see, is a huge thing because that now there's a lot of research into prions and how the folding can be figured out and if there's anything we can do about it. Because I think one thing we haven't mentioned earlier is that prions are so deadly also because they cannot be destroyed as of now, which what which is the scariest thing about them. All the ways we know and how or our body knows and how to kill pr proteins are not, they do not work. So you can't heat them, you can't cut them up, you can't do anything based on, you know, the processes that we have in our body that handle misfolded proteins on a regular basis. But um, so now th this discovery in 2002 was a huge milestone as well. Yeah. In, in and I'm quite sure that there's no known survivors of any of these prion diseases, right? So it, it is 100% fatal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah. the way Gaidesek discovered them was he took the infected brains of a girl who died of Kuru and injected them into uh, two chimpanzees. And one of them developed Kuru a little later. And that's how he, that's how that landmark discovery was made, the connection between uh, the... That, that it was actually infectious, that this kind of disease was infectious. Wow. I mean, there's there's not a, a whole lot that scares me, but <laughs> this stuff is quite, <laughs> is quite yeah. frightening. It's um, quite terrifying. Uh, Shandy, um, well, Kuru has basically disappeared. I think we can agree on that. Um, can you discuss a little bit more about um, uh, the link to cannibalism and how it was transmitted from person to person? and Yes, you know, uh, this every different community seems to have a different way to grieve their dead. And in the Kuru, in the, the four community of Papua New Guinea, specifically, they, I think there was an Okaba tribe, they would, the females and the children, uh, relatives of the deceased, would have to eat their brains or, or other body parts as well. And that's why the females began to get more infected. Females and the children began to get more infected. So in fact, after, uh, after the Australian government banned the practice of cannibalism, the death rate, the, the case rate among children dropped almost 60% because of, you know, they had banned the whole practice. So that, that's significant. And why that was also significant was that before that, people thought it was, like you said, genetic or the four community thought it was related to sorcery and other practices. So they wouldn't have actually made the connection if not for this. So that yeah. was. Um, and and um, as far as the women now, the women, I don't know, 60% of them were women. And then, you know, a, a big bulk of children and, and very, very, very low percentage of men. Mm -hmm. and. So the men just did not participate in the cannibalism. Yeah, I, I don't. That wasn't part of the grieving ritual. It was. Yeah. I think the females and the children were supposed to eat them, and you know, so that it affected them a lot. And I think that was pivotal in a way. That was one of the clues that gave it away to um, Gaidesek when he was observing the community. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know what to say on some of this stuff. Um, <laughs> 
the um like all prion diseases kuru is always fatal uh shandy what's the duration of illness from uh, onset to death the average amount of time from onset of symptoms to death is about 12 months but it can be anywhere from three months to 23 months um the thing about kuru is that actually there's nothing that it can even infect some it can be in your body for decades and mm -hmm. then later on cause symptoms and nothing can be done about it the symptoms appear and the person will die so there is it can go on for six years even in some people but on average it's about 12 months yeah i think and i think that's pretty consistent with a lot of prion our tses um it can be decades so it's a, mm -hmm. a, a long slow thing um the symptoms are broken down into three stages plus a prodromal period uh, can you go into this and describe the horrors that this patient goes through yeah it's uh you know kuru actually means to shiver so that's one of the characteristics um, of the disease. Uh, there are three different stages. One is, uh, the first one is ambulant. The other one is sedentary. And the third one is terminal. And as you mentioned, there's a pre-stage called the prodromal stage that needs to be defined a little better. But if you start in the very early stages, like the prodromal stage, it's joint pain and headaches and uh, small little pains like that, which you, you, no one is going to think that they have a prion disease based right. on so, these symptoms. So very non-specific symptoms. Yes. So yeah. once the, once it hits the ambulance stage is when people actually know that, oh, this, this might be Kuru. So the ambulance stage is marked by the fact that a person with Kuru will be unable to walk a certain way or they might start to be unsteady. And that's usually one of the first symptoms that they find is strange about them. Um, so th that's one of the biggest uh, things about this phase. Um, they may also have involuntary, because the muscles, especially the lower half, the hip and the lower half stop responding as well to the body, to the brain signals. So they're not able to walk and they're not able to, you, you, want, to, you want to stand a certain way and they're not able to do that. They may have involuntary jerks. Um, they're involuntary movements, their reflexes may be really deep and they have, you know, um, and it'll steadily progress, sorry, regress, uh, get get worse uh, until it hits the uh, sedentary phase, which is when the person cannot stand on their own until they, unless they have help from somebody else. So that's when they're only able to sit. So that's the second phase, which is sedentary. So they're able to sit, but it's as torturous as the first one. Um, they start having, they start getting tremors and shivers, which is, you know, the, the name of Kuru means to shiver. And that's, you know, the characteristic part of this disease. Um, they start having their muscles stop listening to them. They may have slurred speech and they, their eyes may dart around without their control. Uh, it's, it's really a brutal, it's just, you're watching your relatives or your loved ones go through such a horrific, um, series of, uh, symptoms and there's nothing you can do about them. Um, the it's they enter the terminal stage when you know as it as the name suggests that's the final stage and when they're not able to sit anymore and they're usually lying down all the time. Um, they are unable to control their urination or defecation or other body functions. And on the other side, you know, they're not able to eat anything either because their muscles stop working and they're not able to swallow. So then they end up being malnutritioned, which affects their immunity. So they start getting chronic infections, wounds do not heal as well. Um, they may start laughing. I think, okay, so uh, in the previous stage, they, they may start laughing uncontrollably. It sounds like a laugh, but that's what Kuru's also called the laughing death for that region, for that reason. So in the terminal phase, they are really, really 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 declining and then you know then they end up uh, dying so there's it's a hundred percent fatal disease um Shandy, concerning um uh, laboratory diagnoses um is there anything available for for was there anything available for kuru back in the day and uh, uh is it is that, is that something they're even considering um maybe you know with other prion diseases well, back in the day, I think the most 
the most uh, the best way that they could diagnose it was because i mean it helped that it was endemic to one region so when they started seeing symptoms of instability or unsteadiness especially in females or children that was one of the best diagnostic methods but eventually there is a test diagnostic test called the ultra sensitive uh, prion amplification method so that's what they use to detect prions in the body um, I, I went ahead and I just I found a photograph and let me see if I can bring it up real quick. Um, of uh, this is off of Wiki, Wikimedia Commons of a child that had Kuru in in this case uh, unable to stand or walk on its own. Um, so yeah, it's really it's really heartbreaking. Horrible. Yeah, very heartbreaking. You're right, um, Shandy. Let's uh, let me ask you about. Um, treatment. As you said, prions are uh, these folded abnormal proteins that are basically resistant to heat and, and so many other uh, methods. Um, no treatment, right? No treatment and nothing so far. And I know people are actively working on it. There is research undergoing. Um, it, there are rare diseases, so they're not as funded as maybe the COVID research was or some other research. But, you know, that's the usual fight among researchers <laughs> yeah. to get the funding to do the research needed. But yeah, there is no cure and none of the bodies, our own bodies way of dealing with proteins work. So the yeah. best way is prevention, awareness. Um, it's like mad cow disease was curbed back. There was a huge outbreak of mad cow disease because people were eating, people were feeding cows, the brains and spinal cords of other cows. And so then that, that caused prion mad cow disease and caused issues in humans and then the government banned that so i think that's that's the best way to kind of curb just better practices with food hygiene yeah i, I can remember before covering a story here in the states and i think it was in new hampshire of um apparently there was a patient that had a prion disease i assume it was christopher Jacob, and uh the instruments went through sterilization, but the sterilization technique didn't kill the prions. And then the instruments were used on you know, oh. future patients. And there was a some kind of an outbreak there years ago. Um, so I, I can't give a lot more detail yeah. to that because I I put up a lot of stories. So I can't, <laughs> yeah, I can't remember everything. But um, yeah. yeah, so basically the prevention with um, Kuru specifically is stop the cannibalism. Yep. Stop the yeah. cannibalism and be better facilities that, you know, the cattle let that breed cows and they, for beef and all of that should kind of be a little more careful with their food yeah. safety practices. And I think they have become more stringent over the years. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right, Shani, any, any final thoughts on Kuru, prions or uh, any of the other diseases that affect humans or animals? Yeah, I think that... Um, you know, I think people are interested in Kuru just because of the, I, I think a large part is because it's tied into the cannibalism and there's a little bit of that, oh my God, factor. But it's also important, even though it's not relevant, perhaps it's not found as much nowadays, it's still relevant to study prion diseases and study Kuru as well. Because as we know, these things tend to change and there might be a new discovery in the future. And all this research, all the data, all the research is really crucial to helping us fight prion diseases in the future. Well, thanks again, Shandi Bawa, for sharing your insights and thoughts and uh, about this devastating disease. And again, I will go ahead and, uh, can, do you know the link to the website, Shandi, uh, for Gideon? Yes, uh, you can find all our blogs on gideononline.com. Gideon is one of the largest infectious diseases database. So. If you're a researcher or a medic, even a doctor or medical educator, there's a lot of resources for you on Gideon Online. Yeah, it's a great website. And I'll go ahead. I just didn't have it memorized. Uh, but I'll definitely put up a link um, in the show notes so people can check out what Gideon has to uh, offer, including a multitude of Shandy Bala blog posts. Very, yes. very good stuff. So, um, again, thanks so much, Shandy. I appreciate uh, you coming on the show once again. Thank you so much, Robert. I had I had a good time as usual. Thank okay, you. Excellent. Bye bye. Bye.